so maybe this will be illustrative. So uh, let me try to set this side by side. And I want you to just uh, uh, think through and, you know, understanding that <laughs> you haven't had uh, much time to um, uh, think about special relativity beyond the, just uh, uh, learning that uh, just now <laughs> maybe that uh, second postulate of special relativity says that light always travels at speed C. Um, see if uh, what this uh, this uh, errata submission is trying to say is something that you would have agreed with. So uh, this submission is referring to this picture here, and um, and and I, I guess uh, it might be worth the time to uh, for me to just read through. Uh, well, actually, read it through the whole section. <laughs> so let me do that. Uh, well, whole section? Yeah, let me read through the whole section. I think I can do that in about 10 minutes, and it'll be worth the time. So so this is section 5.2. Uh, it says, so starting from here, do time intervals depend on who observes them intuitively? It seems that the Time for a process, such as the elapsed time for a foot race, should be the same for all observers. In everyday experiences, disagreements over elapsed time have to do with the accuracy of measuring time. No one would be likely to argue that the actual time interval was different for the moving runner and for the stationary clock displayed. Carefully considering just how time is measured, however, shows that elapsed time does depend on the relative motion of an observer with respect to the process being measured. And I want to make this a little bit more broader. It's not about elapsed time alone. It's about simultaneity, as the section says, relativity of simultaneity. And we'll get to that. Consider how we measure elapsed time. If we use a stopwatch, for example, how do we know when to start and to stop the watch? One method is to use the arrival of light from the event. For example, if you are in a moving car and observe the light arriving from a traffic signal changing from green to red, you know it's time to step on the brake pedal. The timing is more accurate if some sort of electronic detection is used, avoiding human reaction times and other complications. Um, okay, let me. Let's move on. I'll bring that point on later. Um, there's something I want to mention, but next week might be a better uh, time to bring it up. In the lecture, you will see that there's a distinction between what I call seeing and what I call observing in this class. Um, now, suppose two observers use this method to measure the time interval between two flashes of light from flash lens that are a distance apart, a distance apart. On observer A is seated midway on a rail car with the two flash lamps at opposite sides equidistant from her. A pulse of light is emitted from each flash lamp and moves toward observer A, shown in frame A of the figure. The rail car is moving rapidly in the direction indicated by the velocity vector in the diagram. An observer B standing on the platform is facing the rail car as it passes and observes both flashes of light reaching him simultaneously as shown in frame C. So here he sees both uh, flashes simultaneously. He measures the distances from where he saw the pulses originate, finds them equal, equal distance, and concludes that the pulses were emitted simultaneously. However, because of observer A's motion, the pulse from the right of the rail car, from the direction the car is moving, reaches her, observer A, before the pulse from left, as shown in frame B. So the light was emitted here, it traveled some distance, light was emitted here, it travels some distance. In that time that the light travels that some distance, observer A moved towards the, the right side of light. And the light from 
right side reaches are before the right light from the left side. She also measures the distances from within her frame of reference. She's at the midpoint between the two, finds them equal, and concludes that the pulses were not emitted simultaneously. So far, so good. The two observers reach conflicting conclusions about whether the two events at well-separated locations were simultaneous. Both frames of reference are valid and both conclusions are valid. The conclusion one being observer B says they were simultaneous and conclusion two being observer A says they were not simultaneous. Whether two events at separate locations are simultaneous it depends on the motion of the observer relative to the locations of the events. Um, here, the relative velocity between the observers affects whether two events uh, distance apart are observed to be simultaneous. Simultaneity is not absolute. We might have guessed incorrectly that if a light is emitted simultaneously, then two observers halfway between the sources would see the flash simultaneously. Um, yeah. But careful analysis shows that this cannot be the case if the speed of light is the same in all inertia frames. And uh, we might uh, analyze this in more depth in a bit after we go over this. This type of a thought experiment in German, Gedanken experiment, shows that seemingly obvious conclusions must be changed to agree with the postulate of relativity. The validity of thought experiments can only be determined by actual observation, and careful experiments have repeatedly confirmed Einstein's theory of relativity. And this is what I mean that the second postulate is true. It's been repeatedly tested, and <laughs> the conclusions that follow from second postulate has been uh, confirmed over and over again, which is the basis on which we say second postulate is true. Now, when you heard me read through this section that most of it made sense. Now, let me read this errata, which I'm telling you ahead of time is wrong. So, um, so, so with that caution, uh, see if you can spot the point at which this is wrong. So this is what someone who is, usually people submitting errata are physics instructors. So I don't know who wrote this, but I'm assuming he or she was a physics instructor. So this is what someone also who is experienced in physics are saying. The section that describes how observer A perceives the two flashes of light. Observer A will see both flashes of light from the right and the left arrive simultaneously rather than the right before the left as described in the text. This is because observer A is in an inertial, refer in inertial frame of reference and thus she is entitled to say that she is at rest and the platform is moving. So in her inertial frame, she and the two sources of light are at rest and thus light from both sources would reach her at the same time. If the light from both the sources did not reach her at the same time, she would be able to tell that she is the one who is moving, and this will contradict the first postulate of special relativity that the laws of physics are the same for all inertial frames. Observer B, however, would see that the light from the right reach observer A first, because she is moving towards the light, and thus, as perceived by observer B, the two flashes of light will not reach observer A simultaneously. I think you can actually see uh, something that's uh, within the um, within this uh, description here that's internally inconsistent, because. Um, whether these two lights arrive at the observer A at the same time or not, that's an, uh, that's an unchangeable fact. So if uh, these two flashes of light arrive at observer A at the same time in her reference frame, 
then that particular fact would be the same regardless of what other reference frame you are in. So this uh, second part uh, is just uh, uh, contradictory to the first part. If observer A sees these two lights at the <laughs> at the uh, same time, then observer B should also observe that these two flashes of light arrive at observer A at the same time. So, um, so ignoring that second half, which is kind of easy to disprove based on logic alone. Um, if you were reading here and didn't have me to tell you that it's, uh, this is erroneous. Um, where are they, where is this errata submitter wrong? What, what kind, what mistake did they make? I want you to think it through for a bit <laughs> and I'll tell you. And this is, this happens quite commonly when people make mistakes regarding some relativity of simultaneous, uh, relativity of simultaneity. In fact, the textbook, um, <sighs> encourages probably too strong a word. Um, textbook description doesn't prevent this kind of mistakes here. So this is the textbook description of these events. So textbook says, Um, let's see, uh, now suppose two observers use this method to measure the time interval. Uh, uh, an observer A is seated midway. Uh, here it is. A pulse of light is emitted from each flash lamp and moves toward observer A, shown in frame A of the figure. That's all it says. And I, I think this is the place where if you are writing written words on a textbook, it's, uh, um, it, it takes a finesse to uh, not mislead and be accurate. So, in the textbook, they were careful not to specify um, in what reference frame these flashes were simultaneous. I think the way A is drawn encourages people to think that they were set up to be simultaneous in observer A's frame. And I think that's why mistake like this can be easily made, even by people who are uh, educated in physics. Because once you start from the mindset these were simultaneous in observer A's frame, then this is the only consistent thing. And so in the textbook, they try to describe how these pulses were not set up to be simultaneous in observer A's frame. They were instead set up to be simultaneous in observer B's frame. So um, if you want to be more clear, then you can even describe a kind of a triggering mechanism. Maybe uh, there's a kind of a triggering here, device here, device here. You measure them ahead of time so that uh, you make sure these endpoints will pass those two uh, triggering points at the same time. And as they do, you trigger them. And the important thing here is that at the same, whenever you, in special relativity, whenever you say at the same time, you have to specify the reference frame. So, so, so in this uh, textbook description, they didn't quite describe in detail how these will be triggered simultaneously in observer B's frame. But you can think of a contraption that would do that. 
And so having been set up to flash simultaneously in this frame, that's what they did. And um, whether these lamps were moving with the train or not, that's not quite relevant. Although I guess because they are moving with the train, if you wanted to set up a contraption for uh, triggering these simultaneously in the train's reference frame, that is actually easier than triggering them simultaneously in the observer B's reference frame. In fact, that's what I'm describing in the lecture here. This setup is something that can be used to trigger these two lamps simultaneously in the train's reference frame. And what you see here described is that once you've set up that way, set it up so that this light pulse will reach A and B simultaneously, then what you will find is that uh, working through this here and um, applying the second postulate of, um, I guess I kind of describe it around uh, here or so. Um, so in the reference frame of the guy who is um, on the train station, the light pulse that reaches the back end of the train, that reaches it before the light pulse that reaches the front end of the train. So, so once you set up on uh, a set of events to be simultaneous or, or a pair of events to be simultaneous, uh, you have to pick a reference frame in which they can be simultaneous. In. And um, I, I think with the tools we are introducing, um, introducing this week, if it, this is leaving you maybe confused, I think I would rather you be confused than to um, than to not fully absorb the fact that simultaneity is not an absolute thing in special relativity. That whether two events are simultaneous or not, it depends on what reference frame you observe them in, and and um, and. So, so the way it's set up in this lecture here, I set up the events A and B to be simultaneous in the reference frame of the train. Therefore, when you observe it in a frame that's moving relative to the frame, then they are no longer simultaneous. In this textbook section, uh, without describing in detail how they would do that, they set it up so that these two flashes would occur simultaneously in this reference frame. Having set it up that way, they are not simultaneous in observer A's reference frame. I think all of this is, um, <laughs> so uh, I guess, um, I, I think that uh, as clearly as I can, uh, describe it at the moment. Um, uh, maybe uh, let me end this with um, more of a foreshadowing for next week when we'll have a much um, less confusing analytical tool that will help us both diagram this and uh, describe it very um, accurately with uh, that has much room for um, misunderstanding or ambiguity or anything like that. Um, to me, uh, the moment when special relativity made sense was when I learned to use something called a space-time diagram. And it's a tool that's, uh, it, that is introduced in your textbook. I forget which section exactly. It might be section 5.5. Um, and I and I will you will see me use this uh, tool of space time diagram much more extensively than your textbook does. This is an example of space time diagram, but don't think that's quite a, ah yeah. So so this is uh, um, yeah. So section five point five which we cover next week is where you will see space-time diagram um, illustrated and used in the textbook. Uh, so this is where they use it to explain the twin paradox 
Um, and <laughs> yeah, th this is the picture I love. <laughs> um, and and uh, this is uh, illustrating. Um, this is illustrating how uh, something called the Lorentz transformation, which describes the um, transformation of uh, space-time coordinates uh, in a way consistent with two postulates of special relativity, how the coordinates transform um, um, under that Lorentz transformation. And, uh, and I think, yeah, so they talk about simultaneity here, and with this graphical tool, you can see more easily how, how simultaneity is relative. Yeah, in fact, this is <laughs> exactly the picture. So, um, so you know, if uh, this uh, discussion of, so I think if this discussion of relativity or simultaneity is leaving you feeling confused, I, I think that's fine uh, as far as what we are doing this week. Um, I, I would do much rather that you acknowledge, um, I would do much rather that you take this time to unlearn uh, something that uh, you've learned unconscious or subconsciously until now, which is that um, the idea of something happening at the same time is not something that requires a specification of uh, reference frames and coordinates. Uh, that's what we've been doing up until now. And um, I, want you to unlearn that, that whenever someone says things like at the same time or simultaneous, that's a phrase that requires a definition of coordinate system. As much as if I describe something as being along the x-axis, then you would want to know how I'm defining my x-axis. And um, those axes that need to be defined and they obey certain kind of geometry properties that is described here. Uh, it's uh, these axes that <laughs> you see described there. And it, this is a subsection within section 5.5 where you will see that description of simultaneity. Um, so what this is showing here is that this left and the right flash, they were set up to be simultaneous in this coordinate system, X and uh, so in this coordinate system that's uh, described as our uh, resting frame, that would be the frame of this guy, observer B. And the reference frame of observer A, it's described uh, with an axis that looks like this, X prime and CT prime. These axes have rotated. And this uh, uh, lines that are parallel to the X prime axis, that's where uh, time has the same value. So these are the uh, set of points that are simultaneous with this event in the reference frame of the train. And these are the set of points that are simultaneous um, with the right flash in the reference frame of the train. And looking at this, what you see is that the right flash does occur before the left flash does. This is more negative time than the left flash. So this is something we'll go in more detail next week <laughs> after we have fully introduced the tools that um, that we can use to we can use to clearly lay this out. And um, and in the meantime, for this week, uh, where I want to leave you at is unlearning some of the classical intuitions that you've been relying on so far because um, and uh, and uh, the place to place where it really trips up even the people who are experienced in physics is the relative of simultaneity i think it usually trips you up when you have assumed the simultaneity implicitly and you will see that in some examples of paradoxes we'll go over uh, either next week or uh, the week after so um, 